Hi, I'm Marty the director of the Norman Lear Center at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And thank you very much for joining us for what will be, I think, an upbeat, hopeful conversation. If you are a doom scroller, as I am, uh, addicted to bad news because that somehow holds on to our brain stems, this will disappoint you. Um, you will not be finding doom here. You'll be finding realistic understanding of what's going on and practical uh, solutions uh, to maybe... maybe um, the Lear Center, if you don't know us, is all about stories, about narratives. Stories matter is our premise. They show us who we are and they uh, allow us to imagine who we can be. So stories about democracy fall into that category. Stories about the consent of the governed. And what is the story that is now being told about democracy? Well, it's, it's a troubling story. It's a, it's a doom-filled story. It's about voter fraud and about what happens to be a false narrative. And its consequences are real, which are uh, the suppression of voters and uh, seditious behavior. Uh, but there, there is a different story out there, which we're going to be focusing on today. It's also troubling, but it is not uh, false. And from this accurate story will come potentially accurate, upbeat solutions. So to have the conversation about it, we have two terrific panelists who have written a book together. Best that uh, I have known them both since college, which is at least 20 minutes ago. And also the moderator is a longtime colleague of mine at the uh, USC Annenberg School, where he is a professor of communication and also a professor at the Price School of USC. He has a distinguished career, which includes working at the New York Times and also directing the Pew Hispanic Center. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you, who will then take on the proceedings from there, my colleague, Roberto Sura. Thank you, Marty. And thanks uh, to everybody at the Norman Lear Center. And thanks in advance to our two uh, panelists for joining us uh, this afternoon for a conversation about um, really the most fundamental political issue of them all, which is uh, who votes and how they vote and how uh, citizens exercise their franchise in a democracy. Uh, and our guests this afternoon um, have come up with uh, a modest but somewhat radical proposal, um, which were uh, helps us to really, as Marty was saying, rethink uh, where we are today in this country on the question of voting and uh, projects us into a different future. Uh, let me start by introducing uh, our two guests. Um, first, E.J. Dion um, is, um, E.J. I've known for many years, I confess. Um, he likes to joke that, that he has three jobs, one for each of his three children. Um, and in fact, um, he is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, uh, a columnist for the Washington Post, um, and also a professor at Georgetown University. Um, and he does a bunch of other things as well. Um, you've seen him on television, heard him on the radio, and he writes books, uh, including the one we're discussing today. Um, our other panelist is Miles Rappaport, who's a senior fellow um, at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance in innovation um, at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, interestingly for this discussion, he served as Secretary of State for the state of Connecticut, uh, overseeing voting practices there. Um, and he uh, has served as president in the past of both uh, Demos and Common Cause, uh, two very important non-governmental organizations, advocacy groups, think tanks that have done an awful lot of work on the questions we're gonna be discussing today. So, um, let me start first 
by stipulating, I think I speak for everybody who's on in our audience today, that we're, uh, we can stipulate to uh, being against voter suppression, being in favor of laws that make voting easier for as, uh, as large a public as possible. Um, and, um, and we wanna, and we, we endorse basically a lot of the reforms um, that you describe in this book. They're, they're, if you're interested in current debates over voting rights, um, this book has some very concise and handy summaries um, of the major issues and some of the specific topics that come up um, in the voting reform debate um, as it's being worked out now in a number of states and, and sometimes um, in Washington as well. Um, but this book is about something beyond reforming our current voting laws. Um, and it was right there in the invitation to which you all responded. Um, that invitation posed a question. Uh, should Americans be required to vote? Um, and um, our guest today offered an emphatic yes to that question. Uh, and I wanna start by opening up, asking EJ, you propose this idea um, of universal civic duty voting. Can you explain that concept to us um, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about how it would work? Well, thank you, Roberto. First, I want to thank uh, the Annenberg Center and uh, the uh, Annenberg School and the Center, Marty Kaplan, a, a very old friend. I liked 20 minutes ago a lot, Marty. I will uh, treasure that. Also, Jolie Lowe and Kate Fobb. And above all, my old friend, Roberto Soro, uh, we promise not to reminisce at all today, but I am really proud that I worked with uh, Roberto as a colleague in Lebanon, in Ecuador, in Italy, in Washington, D.C., and other places, too. And he is just a wonderful, wonderful, dear human being. And I, before I begin, I also want to thank my co-author, Miles Rappaport. The one thing I always say about Miles, beyond the fact that he's a wonderful human being, <clears throat> is that he has so much energy that if Europe could tap him, they would never have to in, uh, import another drop of Russian oil. Uh, he is really quite something. So let me tell you how we got here, Miles and I, and we had related but different paths. Um, I, if you want to think about our election system now, uh, you might think of it like one of those fancy dinner parties where there is an A-list, a B-list, and a C-list. Uh, the A-list are the people, political candidates pay all the attention to. They are the likely voters. They are the people who vote in election after election. They get almost all of the mail and email and online contact. They're constantly asked to vote. Um, and they are also, uh, the ones on the other side, are constantly tried, are, are subjected to a barrage of messages trying to discourage them uh, from voting. Um, there's a B list of people who are registered but don't vote much. They don't get much attention at all. And uh, C list people who aren't registered, and they're left out of the equation altogether. Um, this has a number of negative consequences. One is we know that when people are asked to do something, they are more likely to do it than if nobody asks them. Um, and in our system, uh, we recreate election after election, lower turnout, because a whole lot of voters are never really even invited to participate in the system. Secondly, as I said, um, a, a candidate, a party, spend a lot of time trying to mobilize their base. Uh, they, as my friend Miles likes to say, they do a lot of enraging to engaging uh, in their campaigns. And then there's a lot of really ugly negative messaging that goes to the base of the other party. That messaging isn't trying to persuade them. It's just trying to get them to stay home. And then, as you mentioned right at the top, Roberto, there are also formal efforts uh, to suppress voters from uh, um, the other side. Um, and we think this is not the best way uh, to run elections. And it is precisely because of the rise of this voter suppression that I got more and more excited about this idea. Um, I became acquainted with it because I spent a lot of time in Australia over the years uh, 
um, gotten to know a lot of people uh, involved on both sides of Australian politics and realized that for 100 years, they have had a system um, where they require the people of Australia, citizens of Australia, uh, to vote. And it's worked very well. I, I, by the way, Roberto, I loved your description of our modest but somewhat radical idea. Um, <laughs> and one of the things about this idea is that if you want proof of concept, a place that has used it for 100 years, I don't know if we'll get a better proof of concept for any other concept. In Australia, because they make it easy, 96% of the citizens are registered. And because they make it easy to vote, 90% of the registered voters cast ballots. Election day in Australia is a kind of party. And before we're done, we'll talk about uh, the democracy sausages everybody gets and the vegan alternatives that Megan and, uh, that uh, Miles and I uh, propose. Our core idea is the best way to defend voting as a right is to insist that it is also a duty. And I can go into more detail about how the system that we propose would work, but we think it would tear down barriers, create a much larger electorate. It is much more of a nudge than a shove or a hammer the penalties are very small and easy to get out of. The rewards we think would be very big in terms of creating a better election process, a more inclusive electorate, um, and a better approach to running elections. Let me, so let's just go back to the basics of this for a second. So you're suggesting that I presumably as a matter of federal law, um, all eligible citizens, meaning any, any U.S. citizen over the age of 18, would be required to vote. I mean, that it would be, that there would be an explicit a statute. Um, each people are required by law to vote. And there would be penalties, as you suggest, they'd be quite modest, a small fine, whatever, an hour of community service. But leaving that aside, in principle, the idea is you require people to vote. Um, and it's not simply an obligation. Um, I mean, it's a specific requirement in order to be uh, a lawful person. I mean, so as not to, not to have violated a, um, a civil statute, um, you're required to vote. Um, so how, tell us something about how that, uh, you would convey that um, to, the notoriously gnarly resistant <laughs> American public um, in, in order to convince them that requiring them to do something um, is, is better than asking them to do something. And, you know, I would throw in, well, our recent experience with something like masking, um, which was like, do this so you don't die. Um, it turned out that the requiring of it I mean, according to some interpretations, was actually counterproductive. Um, but uh, so I just want to be, want you to sort of crystallize this notion of requirement versus voluntary, um, and and what that, how that's going to. Let's start with how does it operate, uh, and then what is the impact? And either Miles, if you want to jump in, the two of you, however you want to divide it up. Sure. Um, so. First of all, a couple points about this. One is uh, talking about uh, voting or participation in elections um, as a duty, as a civic duty, and not just as a right or as a right and a duty. Uh, there's a very, very powerful analogy that we talk about a lot in the book and that I found extremely persuasive, and that is with jury duty. Um, in the United States and for many, many, many years, uh, it has been a civic duty for everyone to serve on a jury if they are called. And the reason for that is because we want the juries that are determining guilt and innocence and appropriate punishment for people to be drawn from a, you know, a, a fully reflective pool of potential jurors. And I think that that uh, corresponds very extremely well with the idea of voting. We want, or we certainly should want, the, uh, that the decisions that affect our lives, the, gover the governance structures that we have, the, the laws that we have, and the people who are making them should be decided upon by a fully 
um, a full representation of the population as a whole. And that's not the case now. As EJ has described, there's the A list, B list, and C list. But it's also a situation where the electorate that actually votes is older, uh, you know, uh, sort of discriminates in a way uh, against young people, against communities of color, against lower income people. And I think the government priorities then tend to reflect that the the older and more regular voters, not to mention the donors, uh, get more of attention than that. So we're all in favor of more people voting. I mean, let's we're, just- we're, Roberto, can I just jump in and, and just describe real briefly how it would work? Because you asked mm -hmm. that first. We are not proposing this only at the federal level. We actually, in the book, as you know, suggest that this may end up happening first as in states or even localities. There are 13 states where uh, municipal county governments have a lot of room to experiment. There has been a bill introduced since our book came out because of the book uh, in Congress. Um, uh, but uh, we also, we think the path will likely pass through the states. Um, the way I'll describe Australia and our system is much like theirs with a couple of American tweaks. If you don't vote in Australia, Australia makes it very easy, registers everybody, makes it easy for people to register, you're required to register, so they have a pretty full voter roll. Um, if you don't vote, you get a little notice from the government saying you didn't vote, why didn't you vote? Um, if you have any sort of reasonable excuse, like I was sick or my child was sick, you don't get fined. And so only about 13% of the non-voters ever have to pay a fine. Um, and if you do pay a fine, it's, uh, 50, it's $20 Australian, which is about $15 American. We propose a very similar system with a, no more than a $20 fine, very importantly because of all the controversy around Ferguson and the fact that poor people get fines piled up on them and then um, there are interest in penalties. There is no interest, no penalties, and this would be a civil, not a criminal fine, so you don't enter into criminality. As you mentioned, if you can't pay the fine, you could uh, do an hour community service. Um, we do a couple other things. We would allow in good American fashion for people to get conscientious objector status. If you really, 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 really don't wanna participate in the system, you could become a conscientious uh, objector. And it's very important. One of the reasons we don't call it compulsory voting is because you don't have to vote for anybody on the ballot. As a moral matter, we don't think you can require citizens to pick from any list that's put in front of them. If they don't wanna vote, they don't have to. They can cast a blank ballot. They can write in Roberto Suro or Marty Kaplan. Uh, they can scrawl a message on the ballot. Um, but just to make sure this is not compulsory speech, uh, we would add a none of the above option as they have in um, uh, Arizona and Nevada. Um, the idea being uh, you're free not to speak, but as with jury duty, you are required to participate. We think this light touch enforcement as we've seen in Australia is sufficient. It works well in comparison with other systems. Heavier uh, penalties don't seem to work any better and so, yes, I think it'll be controversial at the outset and we'll have to make a case for it. We've tried to make it as unonerous as possible to make it as widely acceptable as possible. Just to add to that very quickly is, is you know, we've been talking a lot about Australia, but as, as we say in the book, there are actually 26 countries around the globe, 26 democratic countries around the globe as defined by Freedom House, that utilize a very, a, you know, some variant of uh, universal voting. A number of them are in Latin America. Uruguay is one of the best examples. They have had a very, very stable democracy, and it's just absolutely known and understood by everyone. Um, you know that voting is something that you do. There are different mechanisms of enforcement. By the way, people have said to us, "What about just doing an incentive-based system?" This being America, um, and. What we, what we think is that there are some incentives that we think might you know, be useful. Um, Representative Ayanna Presley has at least been talking a little bit about the idea of doing a, a tax credit for uh, people who register to vote. Um, and you know, a couple of places have, I have uh, experimented with putting people into a lottery uh, where your ticket is, the fact that you voted. But the studies show that the most effective places is where there is some level, light, medium, 
not really heavy, light or medium uh, of enforcement. And that seems to work best in terms of getting a full and fully participatory turnout. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to leave aside you know, some of the comparisons to the Latin American countries in your um, in the book because it's it's a very mixed record. Um, but let's talk about Australia for a second here. Um, so, you know, as you you've anybody who's done any work on Australia or just visited knows it's it's peculiarly deceptive because at times it looks just like the United States, and every time you think that it's like the United States, you realize it's not. Um, and that the differences are actually quite substantial. In this case, this voting system was initiated really at the birth of democracy in Australia. I mean, when it became, took on dominion status and full self-governance um, and has been part of the political culture there, as you note, for a century, really from the onset of full party democracy there. So it's kind of baked into the system. You know, in the United States, as you well know, you know, our origin story is about rebellion against government. We created this system that deliberately puts all these roadblocks um, in, uh, in the path of government doing a lot of things. Um, and individual branches and agencies of government are limited. Um, and so our political culture is really a little bit different. Um, so I'm going back, I want to go back to something that I raised before, which is the calculation that um, requirement in some form, whether it's from the, at the county level, state or federal, whatever, um, is likely to induce civic participation among Americans, particularly those in, in what you're most interested in is that, you know, half to a third of the electorate that doesn't vote on a, on a regular basis um, or that votes occasionally. I mean, so we, you know, we know we have great variation in turnout between presidential years and midterm years and uh, some local elections here in Los Angeles County, sometimes only you know 25% of people show up to vote. Um, so given this political culture, um, which you both have studied so deeply, um, how do you turn that fundamental resistance to compulsion that seems to be so much a part of the American political culture? Well, let me try a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, I agree Australia is a place under its own. It's got a little bit of America in it, a little bit of Britain in it, and a lot of what is all its own. Um, but there are a lot of similarities with us. And we have learned from Australia before I always like to note that most of us assume we have had the secret ballot uh, all forever. Not so. The secret ballot was another Australian idea that the United States adopted after Australia did it. Uh, and it was a long struggle. It was seen as a radical idea. And from the 1880s to the early beginning of the 20th century, there was a big debate about it. And eventually we adopted what was known as the Australian ballot, which is the secret ballot. So the, I think the notion that we can't pick up ideas from other countries and including sure. Australia um, is just not true to our history. I think Americans are very That's, good at I wasn't that. suggesting that. No, but I just want to suggest that we, yeah. in other words, you were, you were underscoring the differences in the political culture. I'm just saying that we have learned from them before. Um, secondly, we know that we are gonna run into a lot of resistance. So I accept, we both, I think, accept the premise of your question. Indeed, uh, you might say that Miles and I are either the most honest or two of the dumbest book writers ever, because we have polling in the book that shows that as of right now, only 26% of Americans support our idea. Uh, and that 48% of Americans strongly oppose it. Now, when we did that polling in February of 2020, I was actually pretty heartened because I thought 26% for this idea, which has never been advanced systematically, um, and as you say, rubs against certain American uh, impulses, I thought that was pretty good. I was also struck by the fact that uh, about half the country seemed at least open to persuasion before anybody tried to persuade people. 
Um, so what are our, our points of persuasion uh, include, as Miles said, that there have been other forms of compulsion that are widely accepted, one being jury duty. And even though people grumble about it, they don't question it as, um, um, as a reasonable requirement. And ju jury service can be a lot more onerous than voting as long as we streamline the system to make it easier to vote. People are required to send their kids to school or homeschool them at least according to certain standards until they're 16 years old. That's a very heavy requirement. There are other requirements that we live with. So then the question becomes, can we make this system as unobtrusive as possible? And that's why we have very light touch enforcement. And finally, can we show people that this system would uh, give us a chance to push aside a lot of the arguments we're having now. We think that this combined with a much better run, better funded, um, less partisan election system could in the long run give increased confidence in electoral outcomes um, and create an election system that people feel good about. But we'll, we'll, it'll take us time to do that. And let me ask, ask Miles to jump in because he has been in legislatures and knows how hard it is to persuade anybody of any reform, particularly politicians who may like the system that elected them just fine. <laughs> well, Roberto, I, I guess I, I don't want to take issue. I mean, I think you're pointing to a, a very important and important part of American culture, but I also think it is possible for uh, for change to take place, um, you know, and I've seen this in my legislative career and when I was Secretary of the State. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, the issue of whether people could get their voting rights restored after they finished their prison sentence was, you know, uh, not thought about very much. And if you said to somebody, what do you think about giving ex-felons voting rights? They would say, no, that's not, you know, we're a tough on crime country. We don't do that. And yet over the last 20 years, uh, a lot of progress has been made. Uh, I worked a lot on the issue of election day vote registration, actually uh, worked on a ballot initiative in California in 2002 on the subject, uh, which did not succeed. But, you know, a few years later, California did adopt uh, same day vote registration. So I believe in all of these reforms. I do believe in encouraging people to vote. I do believe in making it easier for people to um, register. And I believe in all those things. But the truth is, having worked on those things for 35 years, uh, they have moved the needle, but not nearly enough. You know, in 2018, our turnout was a record turnout or pretty much a record turnout for midterm elections. That was 50.3%. And in 2020, as EJ mentioned, you know, despite the pandemic, we had a, you know, a six, uh, you know, the record turnout in a presidential election, and that was 66.2. So you're talking about something that you wouldn't write home to your family about as a, as a wonderful success. Story. So this gives us the opportunity to you know, really move that needle. And despite the difficulties that we're gonna get and despite the skepticism that we are gonna encounter, we think that putting this on the table, I mean, I was amazed when I, heard, when I first read EJ's piece, which he wrote for the Brookings Institution in 2015 with William Galston, you know, two things. One, that this was, had been so dramatically uh, proof of concept, so to speak, in Australia, let's just use that term. Um, you know, and also I thought, how is it that I've been working on these issues for 35 years and I have never been in a discussion about universal voting in the United States. And so I thought, all right, listen, let's put it on the table kind of as a North Star reform, uh, accept the fact that there's gonna be a lot of skepticism, a lot of argumentation, but let's get the conversation started. No. Well, Can I put three quick data points behind what Miles said, just in terms that change is possible Election day registration, only six states did it in 2000, now 21 do. Early in-person voting, 22 states did it in 2000, now 43 states do. Um, no excuse absentee voting has gone from 22 to 34. We understand this is a bigger lift, but we have seen reforms, uh, expansive reforms. I'm playing into what Marty said. We should, while there is voter suppression going on, there have been enormous efforts made to create a more inclusive electorate. So we think we are riding with a trend, broadly speaking, and knowing that there are obstacles to our idea. Excellent. Let me just pause for a second. And oh, I see there's <clears throat> one question has felt that I wanted to encourage um, our audience if they have questions to put them in that Q&A function and uh, we'll be getting them to them in a second. 
Uh, yeah, no, undoubtedly, you know, the, the, the long narrative of voting, um, even, I mean, tempered greatly by what's happening now in certain states, but the meta narrative over the last several decades has been towards more open, more available voting. Um, obviously, it's run into opposition, um, you know, from the Supreme Court on down. But um, uh, we did have a Voting Rights Act, and it, it accomplished a great deal. And then a great many states, as both of you pointed out, uh, took steps. So you, you've raised um, 2020, and you talk, I mean, you've got a very interesting discussion of it in the book, and I wanted to uh, solicit a bit of that from you, um, in that it, you know, in some ways, um, it is greatly paradoxical in that um, it produced this, I would say, unexpected. I'm not sure anybody thought we were going to get as many votes uh, cast in that election as there were. Um, uh, you know, both candidates received more votes than any other candidates uh, for president before uh, by a large measure. Um, and uh, participation rates across the board um, they increased some more for some groups than others, but they increased every, every segment of the population showed greater turnout. And yet, um, it's the most disputed election political, I mean, it's the most disputed election we've had in quite a long time. I mean, the 2000 election was disputed, but it was disputed for about 10 weeks, and then it was over. Um, this is, you know, now we're going into you know, soon it's going to be two years, and this we know is going to go on for long. So there's a paradox there. I mean, we actually reached the level of what some call insurrection over this election. So on the one hand, you had this big turnout. I mean, this thing that we all applaud, uh, the fulfillment of, uh, of goals that I think we all share, and at the same time, um, a display of some of the, you know, saddest, ugliest tendencies uh, in American politics and this larger narrative of polarization, which just, you know, in some analyses of this election, it was the polarization, the extent to which people were so opposed to the other side that brought them out to vote, as opposed to casting affirmative votes. Um, I'd be interested in hearing the way you parse that in terms of this larger narrative of participation and turnout and getting people out. Um, you know, Roberto, one, one phrase that you used I wanted to pick up on, which is something, you know, that 2020 was an excellent turnout, uh, you know, something that we all share. But the truth is, it is not something that we all share, um, you know, and on the negative side. And I think EJ and I try to be uh, realists as well as optimists at the same time. I mean, there is clearly a faction in America that has been around for a long time uh, that does not want uh, large turnouts in the election and would like to enshrine minority rule. And, you know, they have, I think, seen that that's not likely to happen in a in a large turnout and easy to vote election. And so, you know, you see these laws coming up in the states and the and the narrative of the, the big lie narrative to support that. So, I mean, I think we have to do two things at once and it's it's hard to do, which is on the one hand, those efforts have to be fought tooth and nail, you know, through litigation, through legislation through demonstrations in the streets, in the elections in 2022 by the Justice Department with prosecutions where appropriate. And that's a that's a fight that needs to happen. Uh, but at the same time, I think EJ and I both want to say, you know, don't stop thinking about tomorrow, you know, assuming that we can uh, keep our democracy and, and uh, you know, get through this, um, you know, uh, very difficult period we're going through. We also want to think about what we would really, really like to see. And I think while there is um, you know, that kind of individual, don't tread on me, don't tell me what to do, uh, strain in our culture. There's also a communitarian strain and, the, and a public good strain. And I think that's what we want to build on. Just on your point, Roberto, in terms of the vote, the denial of the result, um, I think that we, we said we didn't want to mention a certain name here too much. But I think that absent Donald Trump, you would not have had uh, what happened uh, in uh, 2020, clearly, and the reporting is showing this, almost all Republicans understood that Joe Biden won that election, including Republican politicians. It was the power of Trump within the Republican Party 
that made many of them reluctant to say it, or if they said it, some of them retracted it. I think this is a very peculiar thing um, having to do with Trump. I think what you said that is very important and that we we shouldn't forget is despite that partisanship after the election, in an awful lot of states, Republican secretaries of state, as well as Democratic secretaries of state, Republican election officials, as well as Democratic election officials, really tried to make it easier for people to vote in a pandemic. Um, and that the, we, you know, in some other polling we cite in the book, easier voting uh, is very popular across parties. And it's been kind of charged since uh, the 2000 election and, and it's become more difficult. And we are developing, we're becoming two countries when it comes to voting. The Brennan Center showed that 25 states have expanded opportunity further since 2000 and 19 states have contracted. But again, underneath the numbers, most voters would like to make have it as easy as possible to cast ballots. Uh, and we need to get by this period. And we think if we can get by this period, there are some real openings for further progress. And even now, uh, recently, Kentucky expanded access to voting. South Carolina did. Utah did. Not just blue states. So there is a desire to do that. Um, there's a, a one question from uh, the audience. It's, it's on this point. Um, which is um, the attempt to portray um, voting laws that restrict voting um, as a form of combating fraud, uh, which is you know, a narrative that's been perpetrated, you know, for many many years, but but also uh, obviously clearly advanced in the, the Trump era with sort of greater volume. Um, so I guess the question is how you the question is how do you can you counter um, that specific realm of of accusation? Miles, you ran fraud free elections or virtually fraud free right. elections in Connecticut. Why don't you take that one? <laughs> right. Um, it's interesting. Again, prior to the kind of very uh, uh, you know uh, peculiar is a light word for it circumstances that we find ourselves in now. Um, I think that there, there was a general sense that the voter fraud argument was a red herring, uh, that as many objective studies as they were, and as even, in my, even at the Heritage Foundation, uh, as many times they tried to discover voter fraud, they just, it just wasn't there in any significant degree. And so, you know, it was sort of a debunked uh, theory. Um, you know, which Trump has, uh, you know, has breathed life into. But I do think that, that um, you know, one of the things that we really feel strongly about, and we talk about this when we talk about sort of a variety of, uh, of what we call gateway reforms. You know, some of those are the policy reforms that we were talking about before, and we don't have to go over them all. But one of the things that we talk about is professional, nonpartisan, properly funded election administration. Um, you know, uh, where we're the only country where we have partisan election administrators who are ruling on their own elections. I actually oversaw a recount for my own race. Uh, it was kind of a crazy thing. Um, uh, he won, by the way. Yes, I won. I won fair and square. But fair and square. I won fair and square. Um, but the but you know that mo in in Australia they have a national electoral administration that has real power and that you know, runs the elections and is nonpartisan, et cetera. And most other countries do that. So we need to have less partisanship in our elections. We need to have better funding. You know, during the 2020 elections, the Brennan Center, again, uh, estimated that $4 billion was necessary to really do the elections right and make the accommodations for the pandemic. Congress appropriated $400 million with a promise that the rest would be forthcoming, and it never came. Um, happy to note that in uh, President Biden's budget now, there is $10 billion for election for states for improving election administration. So I think really improving election administration, including, by the way, uh, keeping clean and up to date voter lists. There's nothing wrong, you know, people kind of uh, criticize the idea of voter purging and it's taken on a negative connotation. And in many cases, it should. But the truth is that keeping voter lists clean of voters who have died or who have moved out of state, et cetera, that's a really good thing to do and a good professional administration would do it. So I think that with really, really much better administration, we can both combat the fraud argument and also make it more possible to 
um, implement universal voting if we if states or municipalities decide to do that. I mean, it's interesting. You know, one of the uh, examples you cite of uh, a country with um, required voting is Mexico, and if you the the transition to democracy there that took place in the late '90s and then reached fulfillment and in the presidential election of 2000, which ended 70 years of one party rule, uh, the crucial reform there uh, among many, but I mean, on voting, the crucial reform was the creation of a credible independent agency to supervise voting. Um, and for 20 years, um, participation was high uh, and people generally had faith um, in the, the, the Elections Institute, although, you know, elections were criticized, there were, there were questions about spending, there were fights, uh, but that institute as an independent, nonpartisan operation funded uh, by the, uh, the federal government, but run by independent um, experts was really a cornerstone of managing uh, democracy in Mexico. And sadly, I'm using the past tense because the current president, democratically elected by a large margin, uh, is in the process of dismantling that institute. Uh, it's one of his major objectives and uh, is a, uh, a matter of great dispute. Um, Could I say something on that, Roberto, because uh, not on Mexico, although I agree with what you're saying, um, but on this general question of reforms, one of the things we're careful to do in the book, as you know from having read it, is we do not present our idea of universal voting as the one and only reform we need in our system. And we not only argue that there are certain reforms that have to happen to make this possible, but we also argue there are many reforms that we are sympathetic to, the Electoral College being problematic uh, uh, and increasingly so as the population shifts in the country. I think we're going to get more elections potentially with a popular vote outcome at odds with uh, the Electoral College. So we know there are many problems that we need to solve. We do spend a fair amount of time on election administration uh, because we think that's important. But what we are saying is that by creating this system and by having um, uh, a much larger and broader and inclusive electorate inviting everybody in, um, we will have a better political culture. And I can't resist talking about Australian Election Day, which as a voter in our book told the New York Times, Election Day is like a party in Australia. Voting is on a Saturday. We don't pr prescribe a Saturday, but we do think Election Day should be a holiday. Um, and uh, the, in communities all over the country, polling places um, become a center for fundraising for every school group, every community group, because everybody's out. I mean, people can vote early. There are a lot of other paths to voting, um, but people understand that going to, vote, to going to vote is a way to celebrate in your community. They have as many polling places as they need, which we don't always have. And then, as I mentioned, the democracy sausages, all these groups are serving all kinds of food sold to raise money for civic groups, um, and uh, including those democracy sausages. So I like to say that the one shortcoming of our idea is that people might lose, uh, might gain a little weight on election day, but we're willing to uh, allow for that in order to have a better democracy. But I wanted to live up to Marty saying, we are really hopeful here, and we do think there's a better way uh, to do democracy. Yeah, I, you know, I really liked um, something that Miles said earlier about this idea, which is thinking of it as a, a North Star proposal, um, and not just the specifics of is it, I mean, how much of a fine and how it would be administered, but really this much broader idea of um, of re-envisioning voting as a duty um, and as something that that um, that citizens, even without um, a requirement or penalty, um, would feel uh, a kind of civic compulsion to do, or a, a, or as you put it, civic duty, um, which is is an idea that even in the uh, rambunctious and rebellious um, country we live in, we we do we have adhered to at times the notion that uh, one one has a duty to uh, 
um, a, a community at, at large. Um, in our poll, by the way, 61% of Americans view voting as both a right and a duty, and numbers are equal among Republicans and Democrats. So the notion of voting as a duty is not a foreign idea to us at all, which is something we like to underscore, yeah. or a partisan idea. So let me ask one, one, um, one other topic um, of specific interest here in California, also in many other parts of the country. Uh, when you look at um, turnout for elections, really regardless of the year or, and regardless of the place, uh, you can compare states that have uh, very open voting systems and states that have very restrictive ones. One of the consistent factors is that Latinos vote much significantly less um, than any other group. I mean, it stands out uh, when you compare to other racial and ethnic groups. Um, when you look by age, um, there's really no uh, mistaking the fact that there's this consistent differential. And as I said, you can, it, it, it varies somewhat, obviously, from state to state and election to election. Uh, we know that contested elections bring out people more than determined elections where there's, you know, everybody knows what the outcome is going to be ahead of time. Um, there's, you know, also a standing critique that part of the turnout uh, reflects lack of effort um, by political parties and others. But in fact, there's been a very consistent, you know, and sometimes well, I mean, reasonably funded effort by a number um, of agencies in different places uh, to bring out more Latino voters in, in California and in other states. There are many Latino elected officials, uh, many Latino community voters, so they're very present, community leaders, very present in political discussions. The point of view is represented. There are people on the ballot who uh, voters can identify with. Um, and still uh, the needle has budged a little but not much. Um, how, out of your toolbox here, um, including Earth Star, but in, also thinking about some of the other ideas you have. Is there anything that you see that applies, that might apply specifically to this population? Well, a couple of things. I just want to underscore what you say that we have, as you know, a, a chart in our book. And if you look at 2010, 20 voter turnout among white non-Hispanic, 70.9%. These are Census Bureau figures. Uh, Black Americans, 62.6%. Asian Americans, 59.7, Hispanic, 53.7. Uh, so what you're saying is clearly the it's case. It's true, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry? I said it's true. I said, yeah, no, yeah. it's 100% true. And it's not that there, the, the, uh, on the other hand, there was a big jump in Hispanic turnout between um, uh, uh, 2018 and 2020, although less of a jump uh, between 2016 and 2020, the biggest jump was among Asian Americans. Um, I think that part of what's going on here is there, there is a long history of recent immigrant groups taking time to vote. And I would suspect that if we broke down the Latino vote, uh, we would find that recent arrivals are less likely to vote than a multi-generational uh, Latinos who've been in the United States. And so it's a large recent arrival community. So I think something is going on there. As you mentioned and, and Miles mentioned, it's interesting that this idea of uh, compulsory participation is uh, more common in Latin America than it is in any other part of the world. So I think that um, Latino voters uh, might, might actually take to this even more readily uh, than um, other kinds of voters. But I also think with Latino voters, you, you put your finger on something, which is that while there are efforts to turn out Latinos and there are groups like Voto Latino and others that are really trying very hard to turn out Latino voters, this would really draw a heavy line under the idea, we want you in, we want you in so much that we want you in this pool of people 
who'd be required to vote. And just to go back to Australia for a moment, curiously, one form of discrimination in Australia is that Aboriginal people weren't required to vote until fairly recently. And that was seen as a form of, and rightly so, as a form of exclusion. And I think this is sending a message to Latino voters, you are very much part of this system, just like everyone else is. Uh, Miles, do you have a thought on this? Since uh, I just wanted to pass it on to you. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, clearly, uh, Roberta, what you're pointing to is a, is a real and a and a and a deep uh, problem. So again, going back to EJ's point of where we're not selling this as this is the solution to everything, but I do think that one we think that one of the things that would happen if the idea of universal voting became part of the culture and part of the discussion is that institutions of the society at all levels would bend themselves towards making it possible. Uh, I use the example of uh, if I were a high school principal and I knew that all my uh, students were gonna have to vote um, when they graduated, would I make civic education a more a higher priority in the school? I think probably I would. You know, and if I were an employer, would I give people the chance to be more likely to give people the chance to vote? One thing I did do when I was Secretary of the State is I attended all of the immigration and naturalization services in the state, and we registered people to uh, to vote right then and there. And we got an extraordinary number. It was roughly speaking, ninety percent of the people who 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 took the oath on that day came to the back of the room and registered to vote. And I think would you know again if if people who are naturalized and who are new citizens were gonna be required to vote, uh, would that change the way the immigration services uh, operated? I would hope that it would. So I think the idea of all of the institutions moving in that direction, I think, you know, can help some. By the way, I will say we did have a, a little bit of the other side of the discussion, which is, you know, I think some groups that we talked to, you know, who work in, in the immigrant community is, well, what happens if you're not a citizen and you get bombarded with the, all of the public service announcements and you know Facebook ads, um, you know that you have to vote. You're required to vote, and then you go vote, and it turns out you voted illegally. Uh, I think one of our recommendations, our strong recommendations, is that you know any kind of inadvertent violation uh, would not be subject to you know this penalty or any others. And so just by clarification, I mean, recently arrived immigrants obviously don't automatically access the franchise. You have to uh, go through a process of being first being a legal permanent resident for at least five years and then naturalizing before you can vote. And that that has its own filters. And and also the there there really aren't this is, you know, it's 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 important to, to say just because it's been a matter of dispute and claims. Of uh, immigrant of people who are not eligible voters who are immigrants voting in large numbers is is part of one of the canards that has come out of a voter fraud narrative. There's just no no evidence that uh, in in any numbers at all we've had uh, uh, non eligible immigrants voting either by mistake or willfully. But so in the minutes that remain here, what's next? So where do where do we go next? What 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 are your what are your hopes the um, stick in blue sky here about what uh, what we should see in the next year, the next two years between now and 2024 or after that? where um, what is the path forward that that you want us to embrace? Well, and I, I want to throw I, that to Miles, and okay. I just want to note that on the Q and A, I just noticed Felisa, God bless you, asked the question, well, how do we participate? Ask to promote the idea. Well, I was gonna end by saying this is a book gathering. The first thing you should do is go out and buy this book. Um, <laughs> God love you. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. So whoever's out there, that's the first way you can advance this cause. 100% uh, democracy. Um, Miles is at work on the other part of the answer. That's great of you, right. Roberto. Thank right. you. I mean, I, look, it, you know, no idea just by being asserted in, a, in an op-ed piece or even in a book as, 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 uh, as, as forcefully as we do, um, you know, that's not enough. Uh, there needs to be organizing and there needs to be work to try to move the idea forward. So we are actually creating uh, what's going to be called the 100% Democracy Initiative. Uh, which will have three kind of fundamental strategies uh, 
uh, which are one to really get the idea out in circulation and academic circles and you know thank you very much again to the to USC and the and the Lear Center for having us tonight to do that uh, secondly I believe that there is a kind of robust and growing democracy movement in the country uh, part of it is obviously waging the defensive fights against the assault on democracy but a lot of it is also moving positive reforms so what what I'd like to see is that this idea not supplanting other issue, you know, other ideas on the agenda of those organizations, but this becomes part of the pantheon of the policies that the, the democracy movement supports. And then thirdly, I, my hope is that come uh, 2023 and beyond that, that some uh, states and some municipalities, uh, California seems to be a really, really interesting possibility, an example, um, you know, because one of the problems is that if a municipality did it, in a you know in a state that had suppressive measures, the state legislature would move to to null and void it, but that probably would not happen in California. So I think you have lots and lots of openings in California to move this forward. But we're looking at uh, states. We're going to Minnesota uh, next week. Um, so I think the three par parts is to get it get the idea out and discussed, get it taken up by the democracy movement, and see try to move it legislatively beginning next year and you know we will have uh, fairly soon i hope a kind of a website put up and where people can sign up and become part of the fight i will just say very briefly uh, miles is such a good organizer that when he goes to heaven he's going to organize the angels into a union so i i am confident that he's going to do a lot with a hundred percent democracy um, a bill was already introduced in Connecticut. It's actually an, it's an appendix in our book, and I'm proud to say it was introduced by a former student of mine. Uh, very proud of him. A bill was introduced uh, in Massachusetts. I'm told that a version of this was put forward in California a while back, and now we have a federal bill. Uh, so we think there are locuses of action, and we think that a lot of this will happen, uh, could happen at the municipal level. An awful lot of good reform bubbles up from below. Um, you've had, for example, uh, instant runoffs starting to grow, versions of that um, in New York City, in Maine, in Alaska, a varied uh, set of places. I'd like to see paired Republican and Democratic states uh, do this. I have in mind, for example, Utah and Vermont, who have some, who can, who are forward-looking on some of these kinds of questions. Um, but we want people to imagine this idea and start asking not why would you want to do this, but why not? And uh, if we get people saying why not, then we are halfway there or maybe all the way there. But I want to thank you, Roberto, old friend, for joining us uh, today. Yeah. Well, thank you and, and really encourage you to come out here because California does all kinds of things. I mean, California abolished partisan primaries, abolished partisan redistricting. 100%. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of potential here and people are in a bit of an ornery mood um, because, uh, and I'll close with this thought, um, we all are getting very important lessons uh, about the mistake of presuming that certain things are sacrosanct, um, that certain red lines won't be violated. Um, and we're learning the hard way, as I said, in many realms, um, that freedom has to be defended. Um, and the two of you have laid out an idea around which people can organize themselves uh, to defend the most precious aspect of freedom, which is the ability to um, be a voter and a representative democracy. So thank you both um, for your time today. Thank you both for the great deal of time you've devoted, uh, not just to this idea, but over many years, you have both um, been um, laboring in the fields of democracy um, and, and trying to make this a, a better country. So um, from Los Angeles, uh, thank you. Farewell. The door is open. Come, come here and barnstorm. Um, Will do. Thank it could you happen so much. Here. It could. You never know. Um, it's a. It's. It's a. It's as different from the rest of the United States as Australia. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks a lot, Good afternoon to everybody, um, and thank you for joining us. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Good afternoon. Bye bye.